How's everyone doing? Good? Yes. Yeah. All right. Step down. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And we want to continue on uh, this little mini-series that we're doing on hell, the doctrine of hell. And we uh, looked at great lengths uh, the last time we, we dove into this and we uh, are reading a true story of two beggars. And one might say, well, Brother Dave, as I read in this story, I see one beggar and I see one guy faring sumptuously. But the reality was the Bible says that they both die. And the one that begged in this life is now blessed forever and blessed for eternity. And the one that was blessed in this life is now begging uh, for all eternity. So this is a story of two beggars. One died with a testimony, the other one died with a title. You want to die with a testimony that you've repented of your sin, that you've put all of your trust in God's mercy, God's grace, His Son Jesus Christ, and all that He did for you on Calvary's cross. Amen? Yes. Amen. That is my beautiful wife back there. Yes, indeed, I see her. Yes. I was looking for her, man, I was. Yes. She's my cheerleader. Amen? And uh, anyway, Luke chapter 16, and we want to refresh our memory and look at verse number 19. And, uh, and we dove into this, and, and I'll do a quick refresher, but we want to dive into the other side of the doctrine of hell. But the Bible says this, in God's holy, infallible, inerrant word, the Bible says there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Purple was super rare back in this time. And in order to have purple, you had to have a lot of money to buy it. So purple was a sign of, of being very wealthy back in this, this day. It says that there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, Hades, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and see the Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And as we talked about last time, you can see right here that when you, if somebody dies and goes to hell, they are going to say exactly the same as they were. There was not one apology. There was not... Uh, one plead or one one thing towards Lazarus saying, hey, I'm sorry that I laid you at my gate and just let dogs come. And, you know, because dog was considered a filthy animal in the Jews' mind back then. So that was just, you know, to have a dog come lick on you was, in their mind, uh, the same as, uh, you know, uh, being with pigs because that was the unclean animal in a Jews' mind. So not one apology, not one anything. So the Word of God clearly teaches us that if you die in your sin, you're going to be welded to your sin for all eternity. Now guys, listen. Repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, His finished work on the cross, the fact that He was raised from the dead, when you're willing to turn from sin and call upon His name, that is your divorce from sin. Amen? And the Lord Jesus cleanses us and separates us from our sin by His shed blood, and that's applied to our account by faith. He took our sin... And by His grace and the gift that He gives to us, He gives to us the gift of His righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we're always seen as righteous in His eyes, but understand, when a person dies in their sin and they're welded to their sin permanently, they are now going to be the object of everything that God hates. They had an opportunity. God loved them. God gave His Son for them. But if they die and reject the only offer they have for salvation and reject that and regard the blood of the covenant as unclean and something that they don't want, then they will be objects of God's wrath for all eternity. God is holy and God is just. The reason why we're here, the reason why we're, we live, the reason why the pastor doesn't drown you in the baptistry because... That would be a straight ticket to heaven, amen, if you really say. Well, the reason why we don't do that is because God has a work for us to do, and that is to be his witnesses and to take as many people as we can to heaven with us, not that we can take them, but sharing the gospel with everyone that God gives us an opportunity to share it with so that they also, too, can go to heaven, amen? You can't take anything else with you but friend, foes, and hopefully those foes will get saved and become friends, amen? So... Notice in verse 25, but Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. So you're going to remember every single thing, every opportunity that they had on earth to get saved. They're going to remember all the blessings, all the grace, all the mercy that God gave to them on this planet for the rest of their eternity. But they rejected Christ. Because they can remember. God's going to let them keep their memory. Thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from you, uh, from, from, from you to us cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have the Old Testament. They have the word of God. It's been preached to them. And he said, Nay, Father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now this is where anybody that comes to you and says, Hey, I, I listened to this guy that said he died and he went to hell and took a tour of it and he came back and now he's preaching all across America. What does the word of God say? When you die and go to hell, you go there forever. You don't get out. You don't, you, don't, you don't go and come back. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if you're saved. Yes. And God's word is very clear. There is a gap that it's eternal that if you die and go to hell, you're going to go there forever. That's what God's word teaches. So don't be duped because God's very clear. Listen, it's not going to be miracles that I'm going to use to see people get saved. What does he say in the book of Acts? God has chosen the forces of preaching to save those that will believe. So God looks at preaching as foolishness, but that is what he uses to draw people to himself, is the preaching of God's word. And he, so a, a true disciple always, always follows the message, never the miracles. Amen? Because in Deuteronomy 13, if you study that, God allowed a miracle to happen to test his people. But he says if a false prophet comes to you and does a miracle, but then tries to uh, get you to go after other gods. I, the Lord, am testing you to see if you love the Lord thy God. So guys, listen, a true disciple always, always lands on the Word of God. Not emotions, not what anybody else says, not what anybody else thinks, not what a church says, not what it says, and their doctrinal statements on their website. No, a true Christian always goes to the Word of God, and that's where they plant everything that they have based on this book. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, the Bible, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Was not Jesus Christ himself raised from the dead? And yet many people reject him, even though he himself was raised from the dead. Amen? So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing upon this time. Father, we just want to pause now and say thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Lord, I know that this is a subject that, that a lot of people don't like to hear. It's a subject that's not thrilling to preach on either. And Lord, I just pray with all my heart that you'll fill me with your love and compassion. I just pray, Lord, with all my heart that your word would go forth in power. Or that you would use it to motivate us, to convict us, to remind us, or to refresh us that, that eternity is, is, is real and that, Lord, you are real. And that, Lord, the main business of this church is to be soul winners and to live our life in such a way that you get honor and glory. So that our word, that your word is authenticated in our lives. So Father, I just pray that you'll help us to be fresh. You'll help us never to forget why we're here. You'll help us to never forget that hell is real and that people are going to suffer and there are people suffering even now. And Lord, that hell is not your heart. For you very clearly tell us in your word, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Lord, this is where I should be if it wasn't for your mercy and grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes upon him should not perish, go to heaven, have everlasting life. So, Lord, I just pray with all my heart, you'll fill me with your love and compassion. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to be bold and preach your word the way it needs to be. Lord, I just pray that you'll refresh us and remind us. And if there's one here that's lost, Lord, I pray that they'll repent of their sin and that they'll turn to you and be saved. Lord, calling upon your name, believing that you paid in full their sin on Calvary's cross in the person of your Son, that he bled, that he died, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead, and that, Lord, they'll truly turn from sin and self and call upon you to save them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
You remember, as we went through this, we looked at why hell was real, and I quoted many, many scriptures that the Word of God teaches. The Bible says in Psalm 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and every nation that knoweth not God. We're living in a country now. Guys, listen, every, every pillar's been blown. You know, when they dynamite a building, the dynamite goes off so fast that it literally cuts that cement in half, but there's like that pause before that building falls. Every pillar, moral pillar, has is, is been blown in America. I believe with all my heart we're in that little pause, that little stage right there. And while we're in that little pause before everything collapses, we need to be the light of the world, keep fighting evil, keep preaching, keep being the light that God's called us to be, the salt of the earth, amen? To do all that we can to hold back evil so that why? God is patient, God is long-suffering. Why? Because the Bible teaches us that his long-suffering should be counted, not as slackness, but his long-suffering should be counted because he wants to see other people saved. Are you not glad the Lord tarried long enough to get you saved? Amen? Yes, amen. amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 7, 27, her house, uh, the way of adultery, is the way to hell, descending down to the chambers of death. Isaiah 5, 14, hell has enlarged herself, opened its mouth beyond measure, their glory and the multitude of their pomp, their pride, shall descend into it. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them that can kill the body, but yea, rather fear him that can kill both body and soul in hell, the Bible says. In Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Revelation 19, 20, The false prophet and the beast, at the end of that thousand years, Satan was put into the bottomless pit as the... Uh, as the, at the end of the tribulation period, the beast and the Antichrist were cast into the lake of fire. Jesus came back. We're coming back with him as his saints to the battle of Armageddon. And you remember that the Bible says that he speaks a word. Now, we don't know what he's going to say, but I'm fond of saying probably, hopefully, he'll say something like this. When we come back with the angels, we're on our horses. Jesus is coming to the battle of Armageddon. The false beast or the false uh, prophets there, the Antichrist is there. The Bible says that he will slay him by the breath of his mouth. So in other words, Jesus is going to speak and hopefully it's dropped dead. Amen? And the Bible says that they're cast into the lake of fire. Satan's put into a pit for a thousand years. You go through the millennial reign of Christ, the 1,000 year reign of Christ. At the end of that 1,000 years, Satan is released once again. The Bible says he's going to go out and deceive all those people that gave lip service to the Lord. They gave him lip service, but they didn't give him heart service. The Bible says that God's going to extend people's life, lifetime again. That's when the lion and the lamb are going to lie down together. That's when uh, a child will play uh, by, by a, a, a cobra's hole and be bit but, but not be killed. So God's going to change the face of the earth, not all of it, but he's going to change some of the plains. And the Bible says he's going to require all the nations of the earth to pay homage to his son. And those that don't, the Bible says he'll cause it not to rain, but they're required to come. And so for that thousand years, there's going to be a lot of people that give lip service but not heart service. Satan's going to round all those people up, and the Bible says an army marches on Jerusalem once again. The Bible says that fire comes down out of heaven, devours all of them. And at that time, this planet is going to sit as quiet as an Egyptian tomb, and that's when we go into what's known as the Great White Throne Judgment in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15 where every lost person is going to stand before Almighty God and be judged for their words, for their actions. The Bible says, For every idle word that a man shall speak, he'll render an account of it in the day of judgment. And by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. You'll give an account of your attitudes, your intent, your motives, your actions, every single thing that they've ever done. God says they're going to give an account of it on that day. Boy. Now, they were put into the lake of fire. You remember now, hell, as we talked about it, is two separate places. You have Hades hell, and then you also have what they call Gehenna hell. When a person dies right now, they go to Hades hell. It means wait, the place of waiting, or the place of the dead, or the place of the damned. And the Bible, keep, the Bible says that God keeps those people under punishment. Now, during this time, before Christ died on the cross, because the Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, Right? But when Jesus died, the Bible says that he went down into Abraham's bosom, that side, and let all those people out of there. And that chamber is now empty. Now, scholars vary and say that might have been a place actually in heaven. Some people uh, say that there might be a spiritual place inside of the earth. I don't know. All I do know is that this was a real place. It is a real place. 
And one of those places is now evacuated. Why? Because when the blood of Jesus was shed, it took away their sin, and now they were allowed to be in the presence of God the Father. Amen? But that other side is still there. Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, it says, And the dead, and the dead, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and Hades gave up the dead which were in it as well. And they all stood before God at the great white throne of judgment. Now, the Bible says that anyone's name that was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That word is Gehenna. And that's where that word comes from, was the garbage dump in Jerusalem in the valley of Hinnom. And when Jesus preached his sermons on hell, he probably looked towards that garbage dump, that valley of Hinnom, because it was a fire that raged night and day, 24 hours a day. This, they would put all their trash, uh, people like Lazarus who were too poor to have a funeral, they would put their bodies on there, they would put criminals' bodies on there, and so they burned people and trash, and it burned 24 hours a day, all day long, that's how they took care of their trash back in those days. And so it was like a picture or a furnace of smoke going up and up. And the Bible says in Revelation 14 that the smoke of their torment ascends, ascends upward and there is no rest day or night. And the Bible says that those people that receive the mark will burn in the presence of the Lamb. So they're going to see where they could have been for all eternity according to the Word of God. How sad is that? Have you ever regretted something in your life where you're like, well, if I would have, I could have, I should have done this or done that, and how you regret it? Could you imagine, though, going to hell when Jesus paved the way so that you wouldn't have to and see where you could have been but never get there? Wow. Boy. Then Jesus will say to them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 13, 50 and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is real because Jesus Christ, God Almighty, said it's real. Amen? Amen. 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 It's real. And you remember, the first part of this was the realities of hell. And we looked at the realities that this man was in. He could cry in hell. He could speak in hell. He has desire in hell, according to the Word of God. Verse 25 says he can remember in hell. Verse 27 says he can pray in hell. Uh, but those prayers will never be answered. Amen? Boy. He says torments, plural. So there's all kinds of torments in hell. And the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So the Word of God tells us that there's many realities in hell that you don't want to experience. Amen? And anybody in their right mind does not want to go to hell. But the reality is there's a lot of people going because they refuse to listen to the Word of God. Boy, do you realize that the Bible's going to be at the great white throne judgment? Do you realize that the Bible's going to be there? Because the Bible says, Jesus said, the words, that, the, hey, the words that I speak to you, they will judge you in the last day. Well, where are Jesus' words? They're in the Bible. God's going to open up the Bible, or somebody's going to open up the Bible and say, this is what I said. This is what I said. So it... Does you no good to have a Bible and put it on the shelf or the coffee table like a lot of people do and, and have the book of life that tells them how to get to heaven and never read it for themselves. Boy, that hurts your heart. Amen? Boy, it does. So we looked at the reality, but now tonight, let's look quickly at the reunion in hell. There's going to be a reunion in hell, but it's not going to be the reunion that all these people sing about. No, it's not. The Bible says in verse 28 that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He didn't want a family reunion. He wanted his family to be saved. Which, you know, at the same time, you should have been witnessing to yourself. You should have been busy about the Lord's work, amen? But he didn't. He didn't. And his family, I don't know if they made it. I don't know if they came or not. The Bible doesn't say but I know he was concerned about them, and he believed that they were lost. So the reality is there's not a hell number two. There's only one hell. And if you die and go to hell, you're going to go to both places, ultimately. And the Bible says that you're to number your days. The Bible says that I've written these things unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Not I hope so, I think so, I'm 99.9% .9 so. No, God has given us his Bible so that you can know for a fact that you are saved, that you've been forgiven, and that you're going to go to heaven when you take your last breath. Listen, eternity is too long to be wrong. Amen? Amen. No, I had the gospel piecemeal to me. And through that whole time, nobody ever really told me I had to repent. 
Just believe and say a prayer. Well, man, I prayed that prayer six times between the age of 13 and 19 and was still lost. God doesn't save people in ignorance. In fact, the Bible says in Timothy that it's his will that all people come to a saving knowledge. That word saving also carries the idea of a complete knowledge. So when you share the gospel, you've got to share it completely. Amen? Not just parts of it. When you go to the doctor, do you want half of the cure or do you want all of the cure? Amen? We have to share the gospel. I was talking to my son on the way home. I said, I said could you imagine somebody that said uh, they were a doctor and you went to them and said, hey, doc, I've got something going on. And he looks at you and says, well, I, I don't know how to fix that at all. I mean, I, I know other doctors do, but I don't. Well, then you said, well, what about, well, I know other doctors do, but I don't. I mean, would you go back to that doctor? So when you say you're a doctor, you can, it kind of already comes with the assumption that pretty much you can take care of not all things, but, but a lot of things. Amen? What a crying shame. What an indictment against a Christian that says they love the Lord Jesus Christ, they've been saved, they've been forgiven, they've been delivered from hell, and yet they don't know how to share the gospel themselves with somebody. That's the first thing you need to learn. Amen? Amen. Boy, is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Satan... Loves to take sin and make it pretty. He loves to take rattlesnakes and put sparklers on them and cut their rattle off and, and call it anything else but a rattlesnake. Have you ever noticed that about Satan? You know, Satan will take a, an adulterous affair and call it, man, it's just an affair. It's just a little, little, a little relationship on the side. What does God's Word say? It's adultery. It's sin. Amen? Uh, Satan likes to take people that get drunk and who are uh, drunkards and say that they have a disease. No, they don't have a disease. You're not born with a gene that says, hey, you're going to be a drunk. You're not born with a gene that says, hey, you're, you're automatically going to be a serial killer. You're not born with a gene that says you're going to be a homosexual. No, sin is a choice. Sin is by our fallen nature, but sin is also an act of our will. Amen? It's a choice that we make. It's not something that, that you're inherently born with. Because the Bible says that it's sin. We know that the Bible says that the Lord uh, is not unrighteous. The Bible says He's perfect in all of His ways. The Bible says no unrighteousness dwells within His nature. None. Zero. Zilch. So He is not the author of evil. He is the author of good. Amen? It was our free will that got us in trouble. It was our free will and an act of our will that sinned against God. Now, they didn't have a fallen nature, Adam and Eve, but we did. But even though we have a fallen nature and that's our bent, the bottom line is you are responsible for the sins that you commit and nobody else. You can't blame it on the devil. You can't blame it on your wife. You can't blame it on anybody but you. Amen? Amen. Boy. But Satan has a way of saying, well, it's a disease. No, God says you're a drunkard. God says, man, you're addicted to it. God says you need to repent. God says you need to turn to Him and give your heart and life to Him. Amen? But people love sin, do they not? I had a great time in sin, and God's Word even says sin is pleasurable for a season, but then comes a payday. And you don't want this payday. God doesn't want you to have this payday that we're talking about. Amen? Boy, you know, same-sex marriage. No, God says it's an abomination. It's an abomination. Oh, it, 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 it gives the idea of like a pungent. Have you ever smelled something so pungent that you were repulsed by it? That you just had to get out of it, get away from it? That, that gives the idea of how, how disgusting it is to the Lord. And the word abomination is the highest word that the Bible uses to show God's disdain and disgust for sin. Not all sin's an abomination, but he just calls some sin's an abomination. And homosexuality is one of them. Are you with me? Yes. So Satan wants to come along and kind of, you know, whitewash all those things. And guys, listen. You can't white, whitewash sin. We've got to call it what God calls it. Amen? Now let's go in your Bible to Galatians chapter 6. Go, go to your Bible to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at several uh, verses. Galatians chapter 6. And I uh, want you to see... Or I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse number 19. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19. We want to look at some of these people that you're going to be reunited with because these are the people that go to hell and this is the reunion that they're going to be with. These are the people that they're going to be with in hell 
for all eternity. Now, the Bible says that hell is also a place of outer darkness. So, uh, but the Bible also says it's full of wailing and gnashing of teeth. So I don't know if people are going to be able to see people in hell. I know Satan's going to be there. The beast and the false prophet. All the demonic beings. All the fallen angels are going to be there. It's not going to be a place that you want to be. Amen? Boy. But this is the reunion. And this is what God's damn list says. These are the, these, this is the list of the damn. These are the people that are going to hell if they don't repent and turn to the Lord Jesus and get saved. And God's very clear about this. Now, look at verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, your flesh is at total war with the spirit of God in you. This part of us is unredeemed. It's dead to God. Hates God. And this is the anchor that causes us to drift. This is, that's why Paul said, what a, wretched, what a wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me of this body of death? Amen? Listen, if I had one wish, my wish would be I would never want to sin against God ever again, even in my flesh. That would be my prayer. It really would. It would be my wish. Boy. So he says if we walk by the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust. He didn't say you won't have the desire, but you won't fulfill it. Why? Because he's greater than our nature. Amen? God Almighty's nature working in us. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, and are not under the law, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are what, Brother Dave? Which are these? Notice what it says there. Uh, adultery. And then if you keep reading, I want you to go down there to verse 21. And we're going to go back and look at this. Envying, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such the like of these which I tell you before. So he's already warned them once. Hey, Galatians, if you're living this way, you have a habit of lifestyle, and this is the habit of your life. You're not saved. You're duped. You're deceived. And you need to repent and give your heart to Christ. Because he says, as I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things, practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now go in your Bible, hold your place there, Galatians, but go, go to uh, 1 John, 1 John, and go to chapter number 3, and I want you to look at verse number 8. 1 John, chapter 3, verse number 8. I want you to see what it says now. It says, He that committeth, that means he who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. So he's saying, hey, listen, the devil, that's all he does is practice sin, right? Then he says this. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Praise the Lord. Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not practice sin. Why? Because Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, lives in you. He is greater than the, your human nature. He's greater than you. And so he gives us the supernatural ability, not that it's from us, but it's from him, to say no to sin. That's why the Bible says, if anyone be in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. God transforms your life by the power of him living in and through you. Are you with me? Now, you are not going to be sinless, but you will sin less. Amen? Boy, absolutely. Uh, let's look at a homosexual. Let's say a homosexual gets saved because 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse uh, 11 says they can. Amen? Anybody can that turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. A homosexual that was in that lifestyle as a Christian may mess up and commit another act of homosexuality and be saved. But he can't be committed to the acts of homosexuality. He can't be committed to that lifestyle and really be born again. And there's a lot of people who are committed to sin, live in sin, have a great time in sin, are not bothered by sin, are not convicted by sin, as Hebrews 12 teaches us that we will be, will be rebuked, will be disciplined. And if you be without discipline, you're illegitimate and don't belong to the Lord. That is something that is not preached a lot these days. That's something that upsets a lot of people, but that's what the Word of God says. In fact, God even makes it plainer to us. Let's keep reading. Whosoever is born of God does not practice sin, for his seed, God's word, God's son, remaineth in him, and he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. Then notice what he says now. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. 
Whosoever doeth not righteousness or doesn't practice righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So God makes it clear. Amen? Boy. The Bible says also in John, the one that says they come to know him but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar and the truth's not in them. Now, we're not going to fully keep his commandments, but the bent, the rule of our life is no longer living in sin, practicing sin. The rule of our life is, is doing the right thing. The exception in our life is when we do sin, the Spirit of God will take the Word of God like a whistle and blow that in your heart and say, you are out of bounds. Yeah. Amen? Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I want to be really crystal clear about that as we dive into these uh, people, their lifestyles that God right here teaches us very clearly are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, adultery. Guys, that covers all sexual sin. To, co to commit adultery, though, in the pure sense of the word, is when a man or a woman has unlawful intercourse with somebody other than their wife or their husband. God says it's adultery. God says it's sin. Are you with me? Yes. Then he goes to the next word, fornication. That typically refers mostly to people who are single, who are not married. But it also is used of adultery as well. But understand, when the Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery, God is covering every known sexual sin that's out there. All of it is under the umbrella of thou shalt not commit adultery. And then he has the word fornication, so that people are crystal clear. Amen? And fornication can mean homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, intercourse with animals. Uh, it, it's disgusting. You know, somebody asked me one time, what do you think is worse? And I'm like, well, you know, brother, sin is sin. It is. But he asked me, he said, you know, bestiality, that, that's just awful. And I said, brother, it's wicked. It's, 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 it's something that's unimaginable to me. Amen? But they said, what do you think? Do you think those people will have a greater degree of punishment or people that are homosexuals? And I said, well, I think homosexuals will. Why? Because an animal doesn't have a will. An animal is just a beast that doesn't have a choice. But there's two consenting adults that do. And there's an act of their will. It's a choice to sin against their body and to sin against the Lord. Now, guys, listen, I realize there's people who have family members who are gay. And listen, with all my heart, I, I, I've known some. I, 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 in fact, there was one at the school that I worked with, and I befriended him and did everything I could to, 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 to be kind and to help and to be the Christian that God called me to be. And we were able to have a discussion, and I got to be able to share my testimony in a loving way with him, but I was very also to the point, saying, God's Word says your lifestyle is sin. And just like my lifestyle before I got saved was sin. Amen? Listen, we can't have a pedestal when it comes to sin because we're all in the same boat. Listen, a virgin's going to burn in the same hell that a, a porn star is going to burn in if they don't go to Jesus, if they don't go to Calvary, if they don't repent and give their heart to Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes, amen. So we're not here on a soapbox, but God's Word is very clear that homosexuality is an abomination. In fact, if this was the Old Testament and this world was still ruled by a theocracy, God being the judge, jury, and the sheriff, there'd be a lot of dead people right now. Boy, a lot of dead people. God says that they were to be stoned to death. Boy. Even people that committed adultery were to be stoned to death. Wow. Uh, teenagers who were rebellious, who were uh, unruly, that couldn't have a harness put on them, even some of them got stoned. To death. So we praise God for His grace and mercy. We praise God for the cross. We praise God that's where the wrath and the fire fell instead of us. Amen? Amen. Boy. <clears throat> it, it talks about it in a physical sense, but it also talks about it in a moral sense. Anything the opposite of purity, this word absolutely covers. It also covers the idea of somebody who's living in luxury like the rich man who just spends his money uh, any way he wants to without any regard to God, without any regard to eternity, without any regard to souls, without any regard to anything doing with the Lord when it comes to the money that God put in that man's pocket. So it gives the idea of just wanting and, and living in luxury, but also it gives the idea of, of sexual immorality as well. Anything impure, your thoughts. You know, the Bible says the thinking of folly is sin. Boy, a lot of teenagers need to hear that. Amen? The Bible says that the thoughts of their heart were continually evil in Genesis chapter 6 and the flood came. Because 
God knows if your thoughts are all evil, your actions are all wrong too. Amen? Amen. Boy. So he talks about uncleanness, impurity of lustful, luxurious living. Uh, living in a way and, 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 and wasting resources that could be used for so many other things. But now keep in mind, this was their lifestyle. This is not something that they, 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 they did and said, man, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. I, I need to go the other way. These are talking about people that have a lifestyle. Um, it, it gives the idea uh, also here, here's the next word. Uh, it's uh, lasciviousness there, lasciviousness. And basically it talks about uh, wantness or outrageousness, shamelessness, insolence. Uh, people who are obstinate, people who uh, willfully go into sin, who love sin, who want sin, who uh, are not bothered by sin at all. Boy, those are people that are going to be in hell. Uh, the Bible says they're idolatry. You know, what is idolatry, Brother Dave? Well, idolatry is uh, giving your time, your energy, your devotion to anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? It could be physical. It could be something that's uh, immaterial. Uh, you could be more in love with, with, with a woman, or a woman could be more in love with a man than they are God. Anything that comes between you and the Lord, anything that comes between you and your devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ, God says it's adultery. Also, adultery is uh, making a false image of, of, of the invisible God. God says that, you know, there's nothing that can compare to me, so don't make any engraven image. Because when you bow down to, to an idol, the Bible says in Corinthians that demons are present. Why are demons present when there's the worship of idols? Because Satan, being the head demon himself, wanted to be like God, wanted to be worshipped as God. So if the leader wants to be worshipped, all of his cronies want to be worshipped too. And the Bible is very clear that when people bow down to idols, there are demons present. And listen, don't think for a second those demons are not listening to what they're praying about. And if those demons can manipulate some things that make it seem like their prayers are being answered, boy, all they're going to do is keep them addicted to keeping their focus off Christ. So they ultimately could be led to hell. Boy. And one person said to even think about God in the wrong way, to make God, out, to make God in your mind something that is not is sin. And it's the purest form of idolatry. Boy. Mm. Also, there's a... Um, Witchcraft. Now we dealt a whole big huge thing here on witchcraft, but the word in the Greek is pharmakeia. That's where we get our English word pharmacy from. So it talks about people that use drugs and abuse drugs in ways that they shouldn't. They take, they take their prescriptions in a way that they shouldn't take it. They abuse it. But also in sorcery, they would induce themselves with drugs because they said that it opens them up, and I'm sure it does. It opens them up to that demonic activity, that demonic channeling. But witchcraft is the sin of rebellion. Why? Because Satan is the ultimate one who is the ultimate rebel. He's the ultimate rogue. And Satan is behind all witchcraft. He's behind all, occult, all, all occultic matters. So anything that deals with wizards and witches and all of those things, the Word of God says, is rooted ultimately in Satan. And it's rebellion. But it also gives the idea of using drugs and potions and different things to induce people. To uh, you know, cast spells on people, to hurt them, to harm them, to curse them. Uh, people claim to be white witches, and they say that well, we're doing it for good, and we're using all these things for good. But the bottom line is, they're drinking from a dirty well, and that well is Satan. And God says those that practice witchcraft or sorcery are on their way to hell, and they need to repent and get saved. Boy, what else does the Bible say, Church? What's the next word there? You see it? Hatred. What is that, Brother Dave? Hatred. Odious. Hateful. Hostile. Opposing one another. Uh, opposing God in your mind. Because the Bible says you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. So if I'm thinking wrong about you, even thinking wrong about you, God says you're in sin and you're not loving these people that I died for and created. Do we think wrong about people? Do we not get irritated and frustrated? Absolutely. We do. Amen. But but if you're saved, you'll be convicted and you'll you'll not think that way because the bottom line is you don't want God thinking that way of you, nor would the Lord think that way of you. Amen. But if you, you focus on the negative aspects of a person without looking at the positive aspects of that person, whether they're gifted, talented, or not, 
You're going to find yourself being critical. You're going to find yourself being in trouble because the Bible says the same judgment that you judge with, God will measure that back to you. And you don't want him doing that. Amen? Now, I had a conversation this week with somebody who was just overly critical, overly hard. And I said, in a loving way, I said, look, you don't want to go down that road. Hey, I, hey, it's one thing to say, hey, man, it's wrong. It's this, it's that. But when you get an attitude towards somebody, and you're just, all you, all you do is get frustrated when you think about somebody, man, your spirit's not right with God. It's not. And you need to take that frustration and give it to the Lord. Amen? And I believe there's some frustration that's real and that some frustration that's not sinful. But, but it, it can fester in, into all kinds of things, and you can get yourself in trouble quick. Amen? But God's Word is very clear that if you hate somebody, you're a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him, according to 1 John 3, 15. So God's very serious about that. You know, these people that are Ku Klux Klan, and, and we hate Jews, and we hate blacks, and we hate all that, but yet they got these crosses and these signs... John 3, 16 and all that stuff, man. They are worshiping the Lord in vain. They are lost. If you really hate somebody, God's word says, listen, you're lost and you need to get saved. Boy, Peter had an attitude and God had to teach him, hey, hey, don't you call anything unclean that I've declared clean. Amen. Remember that sheet that came down when he was on the roof? And then he said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons and that those that do righteous, those that do good will be blessed by him. And the last time I checked my Bible, it says, for God so loved the world. Did you see the word white in there? Did you see the word black, brown, red, or yellow in there? No. No. And I realize people that are prejudiced are taught to be that way from a kid, mostly. It's something that's taught. In the military, you couldn't show any form of it at all. And if you were caught, they'd put you in the brig. Now, they'd put you in jail. Or they would. My dad invited a black guy to his wedding, and the preacher walked up to my dad. Now, my dad was lost and said, uh, we don't want any black people here. And my dad said, well, this is what you call Christianity? You can have it, son. My dad didn't get saved until his 50s. Wow. A preacher. Boy. Man, you're like, brother, read the Bible. Amen? Boy. And listen, I can say that to myself. Dave, read the Bible. Amen? I'm not trying to be hard, but boy. Hateful. What else does the Bible say? Variance. What does that mean, Brother Dave? It means contentions. It means strife. It means wrangling. It, it, it gives the idea of somebody that wants to be in competition with you. Somebody that wants to have the edge. Somebody that wants to force their will on you. And they cause trouble and they cause strife. And they know in their hearts that they should admit, hey, you know what they're saying to me is right, but I'm not going to admit that. And they're obstinate and they're stubborn and they cause trouble. Those are people that cause trouble in churches. Those are people that split churches because they're obstinate and they want their way. They have the spirit of that same gentleman over there in uh, uh, the book of uh, uh, Third John. Boy, he wanted to have the preeminence. He kicked people out of the church if they didn't agree with how he wanted to do things. You know that boss hog? Boy, I've been to some churches that there were some people that really thought they were the boss hogs. Boy. And they would just realize it's not about power, and it's not about position. And it's about seeing people get saved, man. Amen? And growing and being conformed to the image of Christ. What else does the Bible say, church? What's the next word there? Emulations. And that means excitement of the mind. It, it gives the idea of fervor. It means embracing or pursuing or defending anything. Have you ever met somebody that will just defend anything? And they'll defend wrong things? And they do it with passion, and they do it with a with like a venom, a venom and heat in their heart. Boy, God says, people that are zealous like that, but they're zealous for things that are wrong. Emulation, the fierceness, the indignation. Uh, it carries the idea of also having envy and rivalry in their hearts towards somebody. Uh, that's what that word means. And then, um, what else does the word of God say there, church? It, it what's that? Wrath. Wrath. What does that mean? It gives the idea of somebody just boiling up, exploding, and then calming down. And then exploding, and then calming down. And they just vent all their wrath. You know what the Bible says about a person that vents all their feelings all at once? They're a fool. A fool vents all of his feelings at once. Boy. In many words, sin is not lacking. That's what the scripture says. Amen? Well, I guarantee I've been guilty of that. This starts getting good to you. The words just start rolling. Amen? 
But the Bible says, he who guards his mouth guards his soul from many troubles. Amen? Boy, oh boy. What's the next word there? Anger. Angry, right? It's, it gives the idea of passion and flaming. Uh, it, it gives the idea also that anger that's unchecked and uncontrolled ultimately can lead to murder. It, it leads to bitterness. It leads to hardness. It leads to being condemning and critical. If it's not in check, we did a whole series on anger. What else does the Bible say? Church? What's the next word there? You see it? Strive. Unruly, fractious. Uh, it basically means that somebody uh, can't be harnessed, somebody that can't be controlled, somebody that is going to do and say what they're going to say no matter what. I, I've dealt with a bunch of people like that. Well, you know, the Bible says, well, the Bible says, well, you know, I, well, you know brother, I, you know the Bible. And he, what? What? Are you kidding me? Listen, if you talk to somebody and you say the Scripture says this and Jesus says that, and they say, well, well, you know, I, I, I know that's what the Bible says, but. There are no buts. Amen? You're dealing probably with a goat at that point because goats like to buck. And they're not bucking you. They're bucking what? The Word of God. But, man, there are some people who are that way. They're quarrelsome. Uh, they're incorrigible. They're uh, fractitious. They're, 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 they're people that just want to cause trouble. They're people that want attention, and they get the attention the wrong way. Boy, don't be don't be that person. Amen. Man, does not God's word say, I hate those that sow discord among the brethren? Boy. Boy. Sedition. What does that mean, Brother Dave? Uh, it means a person that stands. It means it gives the idea of a, of a person that is just so set in their ways they're gonna have their way, and they're gonna disagree with you, even though they shouldn't be disagreeing with you, and they're going to force their will onto other people. Seditions. Boy. Insurrection uh, it gives the idea of wanting to be popular, wanting to be the go-to guy. Well, I've seen that in church too. Well, you know, I, I've been here, brother, for this long. And, and they love it when people come to them. And they, they, boy, they just feed on that like a mouse feeds on cheese. And all it is is pride and arrogance. Do you realize that when you fight with somebody, and when I, I'm, I'm guilty when I fight with somebody, the Bible says when you get to fighting and you have contentions, and you're not getting anywhere. The Bible says that contentions only come because of pride. There is pride in the midst, in either your heart, their heart, or both of your hearts. Boy. Hmm. God says people that are like that, people that practice that, people that have that attitude are that way. We shouldn't be that way. Heresies. What is that, Brother Dave? Heresies is leading people away from the truth, uh, teaching people something that is false, teaching people something that is not found in the 66 books, of this canon, which means straight rule, the Word of God. Teaching something other than what Jesus Christ taught or taking something that God said and taking it out of context like Satan did. It's heresy. It's uh, rebellion against God. Um, that which is chosen, it, it talks about like the Sadducees. They didn't, believe in, they didn't believe in angels, nor did they believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. Amen? Got to throw that in there. All right, make sure you guys are still paying attention. Boy, oh boy. Uh, what else does the Word of God say? What's the next word there? What's that? Envy. envy. Boy, envy. Man, that's malice. That's hate. People that are envious are always critical. People that are envious are always hateful. And people that are envious cannot encourage you. They can't uh, lift you up. They can't build you up. They cannot be the Barnabas that you need them to be when they're guilty of envy. Because they want what you want. Or they think to themselves, you know what? Who, who, who are you? You're the last person that should be in that position. I should be in that position. I know more than you do. I am more talented. I can do this better. I, me, me, myself, and I. And that's what it is. They have ingrown eyeballs and all they can see is themselves. So when you're around somebody that's never encouraging, that's always critical, that can never lift you up, or, or, or you know, you, you see people with that fake smile. Well, you know what? That's what you learn about the South, quick. They'll smile at your face, but buddy, they'll talk quick behind your back. Amen? Boy. Envious, jealous people are going to find fault where there is no fault. They're going to criticize you whether you deserve it or not. They are in competition with you. And God's Word says that envy is a sin. And that people that practice envy and have a lifestyle of envy are guilty. Then it says murders. Then drunkenness. 
Uh, that word drunkenness not only means a falling down drunk that's getting drunk and puking his guts out in the street, but it means that somebody that is just intoxicated, the code word today is getting a buzz. You don't have to be a falling down drunk to be guilty of being drunk in God's eyes. You can be under the influence of alcohol, get that good feeling, all those things, and, and, and have it control you. And as soon as anything else unlawfully controls you, you're in the flesh, you're in sin, and you're out of the will of God, according to the Word of God. And God says all drunkards will have their part in the lake of fire, so therefore we know it's not a disease, it's a sin that they need to repent of. Are you with me? Boy, I tell you what. Let me just stop there and we'll, we'll, we'll continue. But there's another word in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And it's the word of fetiment. And when you look up that word, it literally means it comes from the term soft. In a fetiment, person is a person or a guy or girl, a guy that wants to act like a girl and a girl that wants to act like a boy. Now the Old Testament says a man will not dress like a woman and a girl will not dress like a man. It's an abomination to the Lord. And when you look in the Hebrew, it talks about you need to wear clothes that really define you as who you really are. Boy. Now that word comes from the term soft. And that's why sometimes when you see people who are lesbians, you'll have one that dresses and has a haircut like a man and you'll have one that's kind of like girly and, and looks like a girl and looks like a girl should. But then sometimes it also carries the idea of a young man who solicits himself, a young person who solicits himself to other males. A young, young man with older men in a homosexual relationship. It also gives that idea. But it also comes from the term uncertain. So in other words, you're uncertain. Have you ever seen anybody that you just you really don't know and you're not being mean, but because of how they dress and what they're doing, you just don't know if it's a guy, is it a girl? You, know, you struggle with that. And that's not being mean. But I, I'm just saying, listen, God's Word says, listen, when you're born... By, or you're created by God in the womb, and listen, by, biologically, you cannot change who you are. Scientifically, even an honest scientist will tell you that if you're born a male or a female, you are a female and you are a 100% male. There is no crossing of the two. There is no intermixing of the two. You're either 100% female or you're 100% male. Period. Amen. And we live in a society today that then begins to teach these kids that, hey, well, you know, you're, you're, you're just a girl trapped in a man's body. God's Word says, no, you're a homosexual. And you need to get saved. You need to repent. You need to turn from that sin. And we need to be very clear. Not, not me, not unkind. Because listen, I know people right now who have a homosexual son or daughter and it breaks their heart. And I know it would break mine too. And those people don't need to be hated and mocked and despised. They need to be loved and helped. Amen? Yes. Just like the fornicator is going to go to the same hell as some homosexual goes to. Amen? Everyone's going to the same hell if they don't repent and give their heart to Christ. But guys, we live in a society where we need to speak up and say, look, you're going to be offended. And it's not going to be me that's going to offend you. Now you can't put your, your hands around God's neck, but you can put your hands around a preacher's neck and that's why people get upset. But the Word of God says, listen, it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is going to what? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They need the truth. Amen? Listen, I, I, when I go to the doctor and they give me shots, do you think I'm thrilled? No, but man, going to the doctor and the dentist can be painful sometimes. Amen? Well, listen, sharing the Word of God can also be painful for people. But they need that needle to get in them so that the Lord Jesus Christ can infuse His grace and mercy and work in their heart to lead them to repentance in Him. Amen? And the only way that's going to happen is if you preach the truth and give them the truth of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, indestructible, eternal Word. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for your patience. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, we just truly pray know that every one of us can find ourselves somewhere in that list. Not one list in the Bible that we can't find ourselves on. And Lord, we just want to first of all to say thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we just thank you that it's your will that none should perish. That it's your will that none should go to hell. But that all should come to repentance and be saved. Have heaven as their home. Lord, you tell us very clearly that you come that we might have life. 
that we might have it more abundantly. Or you even said that you didn't come into the world to condemn it, but you came into the world to save sinners. Lord, I just praise you for saving me. Praise you so much for having mercy on me. Lord, help us all to have mercy on other people. And be an extension of your grace and your mercy. Lord, also help us to be people true. And help us to be bold and help us to proclaim your word. Because, Lord, it's your word and only your word that's going to pierce that rhinoceros heart, that rhinoceros high. And so, Lord, I just pray with all my heart that you'll encourage these, your people, tonight. That, Lord, you'll help them to be bold. Lord, you've given us the power to witness. You've given us the power and victory over death. You've given us victory and power over the love of sin, the habit of sin, uh, the, the overwhelming desire to want to sin. Lord, you've you set us free from all those things if we, if we know you. Lord, we just rejoice and just praise you for who you are and what you do for us. Lord, I just pray for all of our lost family members, no matter what they're guilty of, no matter what they're involved in. Lord, I know that there's a lot of people's hearts that are broke. And it's not a joke. And it's a very painful thought. And I pray with all my heart, Lord, that you'll move in their hearts, that you'll move in their lives, that, Lord, you'll give opportunities to share your love, to share and show your son Jesus in and through them, that, Lord, that you'll grant them repentance, that, Lord, you'll convict them of sin, that you'll help them to see the righteousness that's found in your son Jesus, and that, Lord, it's the work that you did for them on the cross, the fact that you were raised from the dead and that, Lord, that prayed to give them a heart to call upon your name to be saved. But, Lord, we pray for those in our family that are lost. Pray for Carl, my, my father-in-law. Lord, he's, he's getting up in age. And I know he knows it in his head, but, Lord, I just truly pray that you'll put it into his heart. So, Lord, truly forgive us in so many areas, Lord, of our lives. And Lord, help us to be a church that focuses and fishes and loves people and serves people and help us to be about your business. There's no one here tonight that does not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God has revealed to you that you're lost and that you need to repent and that you need to truly once and for all give your heart and life to Him by placing your trust in Him, placing your trust in His death, His burial, and His resurrection from the dead and that you believe that in your heart and you're Willing to confess Him as Lord, as the Scripture says. I want you to raise your hand right now and say, Brother Dave, I, I, I want to be saved, and I want to ask the Lord Jesus to save me right now. Raise your hand right now. Anybody say, Brother Dave, that's me. That's me. I need to do that. I want to do that. All right. Well, Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. Just ask, Lord, that you'll give us opportunities. That, Lord, you'll continue to meet the needs of this church. And just want to say thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you for everyone that's serving. Thank you for everyone, Lord, that signed up to serve and to, to be a blessing to this body. Lord, I just pray with all my heart that you'll bless the work of their hands. That, Lord, you'll continue to give us fruit that remains here at Friendship Baptist Church. And, Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to Amen. ask Brother Dave if you'll close us in prayer.